Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. I'm here today with Benjamin Watkins of Real Atheology. So we're going to discuss today, kind of if we could umbrella it, uh, the goodness of God. So this is going to cover the moral argument. It's going to cover Euthyphro. Uh, let's see here, the problem of evil and all these really interesting questions. So obviously, um, you know, Ben is an atheist. I'm a theist, a theist of the natural law variety. Ben is an ethical non-naturalist. So this is going to actually be a very interesting exchange of ideas. Uh, we've discussed natural law theory before. This time we're trying to apply our ideas to, you know, actual, you know, discussions in the philosophy of religion. The goal isn't necessarily to debate or to have one side win. It's just to, you know, have an exchange of ideas and hopefully fine tune both of our positions by the end. So Ben, do you want to say anything before we start? Uh, no, I think that pretty much covers it. I, um, that, uh, first off, thanks for having me on again. Um, our last conversation was really, really great. So I'm really excited for this one. Yeah, let's hope that I can live up to it. You know, I, I think before this, I told you I woke up from a nap and then, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So let's see how, how fine tuned my philosophy is. All right. So let me get my slides ready. Mm, let me see. There we go. Can you see that slide? I can, and I have it up on my screen as well. All right. So I am just going to, we're not going to do the whole PowerPoint slide at once. Ben and I agreed that we should hit things uh, issue by issue. So I'm just going to start off by explaining some of my basic views, and then we'll go um, into first the moral argument, then Euthyphro, and then the problem of evil. And so hopefully in this conversation, we'll be able to refine this PowerPoint. Yeah, hopefully. Substantive ways. That's one of the. That's probably one of our main goals is to really unpack these ideas and have a clearer expression of them. Mm -hmm. So here's the Thomistic moral argument. So the Thomistic moral argument that I've been working on goes like this: Premise one, moral realism is true. Premise two, if moral realism is true, then God exists. Premise three, therefore God exists. Premise four, if God exists, then moral realism is true. Premise five, therefore moral realism is true. Premise six, therefore, moral realism is true if and only if God exists. So let me try and just explain the mechanics of the argument, because it might seem a little redundant, for instance, because someone could say, well, why didn't you just say, yeah, uh, you know, if God exists, then moral realism is true, or uh, what is it? Yeah, if, if moral realism is true, why didn't you just stop it at the first three premises of the argument? And the reason why is because I think the fourth premise is also important for the Euthyphro dilemma, because one of the most natural objections is, well, no. Um, more realism can't lead to God's existence because God's existence is somehow going to undermine our very concept of moral realism or goodness with triviality and so forth. And we'll get to that eventually. So that's why I included the fourth premise. And then the sixth is just kind of a biconditional to give the argument extra bite, uh, you know, to make it more controversial just to see how other people will react. Um, let me see here. So let me unpack then. Uh, kind of the, how some of the premises work. So if God exists, then more realism is true. So usually speaking, when people like William Lane Craig or other theists explain the moral argument, they usually operate on some version of divine command theory. I don't like strong divine command theory, but I do like if it's supplemented with natural law theory, and that's going to be an interesting discussion for the next uh, few issues. But here's how the argument basically works. So the argument goes like this. Um, we have four principles or four ideas or theses from the Thomistic uh, philosophy, that is the philosophy developed by St. Thomas Aquinas. And my argument here is that these four theses can not only lead to the existence of God, but they also lead to an ethical theory in its own right. So the principle of sufficient reason, to quote it from Alexander Proust, Everything that is the case must have a reason why it is the case. Necessarily every true or at least every contingent true proposition has an explanation. Every event has a cause. So Pruss summarizes it on the back of the book, actually, um, as every contingent fact has an explanation. Real essentialism is the idea that the metaphysical position that everything is the world, that everything in the world has an essence or nature that fixes its identity and essence of a thing is its nature, that whereby it is what it is. It is what we grasp intellectually when we identify things, genus, and specific difference. Things have a real definition of what they are. The convertibility principle states, goodness is the same as being itself, 
but considered from a particular point of view, that of fulfillment of appetite. That's from David Otterberg's book, The Metaphysics of Good and Evil. So in other words, goodness is the actualization of potential, a kind of fullness. Uh, and there are different, like, there are various arguments they can give for each of these. Um, and I'll do that after I present all the definitions. So the principle of finality states, every nature is ordered to an end. That nature does not act in vain. That the end is the first principle activity and that the end is the reason for all movement. And in short, if A is by nature an efficient cause of B, then generating B must be the final cause of A. So just to go down each of these real quick to offer an argument, um, different arguments have been offered for the principle of sufficient reason. One of them is just self-evidence. It just seems to make sense that everything that is contingent or could have been otherwise has an explanation for why it's one way rather than the other. Um, and you know, some people would claim that all of science itself basically depends upon the PSR. Real essentialism is the idea that um, in the world we observe multiplicity and unity, right? So we observe that there are multiple things in the world and that these, this multiplicity also has bits of unity in it. So for instance, I, I can tell that I am not identical to the tree that's outside my window. And I can tell that Ben is not identical to let's say the sun in the sky. There is something actually different between these two substances in question. And it's not just a conceptual difference, but it's something real or proper to each of these things in question. And the argument is that in real essentialism, uh, David Otterberg's book, identifying an essence is kind of a logical precursor to doing anything else. It's the, it's the thing that we have to grasp in order to be able to identify multi multiplicity and unity in the world. And I think he, uh, Otterberg says something like, um, metaphysics is prior to epistemology, right? Because epistemology is thinking about something. Well, if you're gonna be thinking about things, then you had better know what that thing is and what individuates it from other things in question. So that's the idea of real essentialism. The convertibility principle, I mean, one argument you can give is a really sim simple semantic argument. And I did this last time with Ben. So for instance, um, Otterberg uses this in his paper, um, being in goodness. So, you know, he says, imagine that you're walking down the road with your son or, or in a, on a, you're hiking with your son and you see on a tree a, a particular triangle. And you tell your son, that's a pretty good triangle. And then you start asking yourself, huh, that's kind of a weird thing. One, one, I noticed that it was a triangle and I said it was pretty good. So you're measuring an instantiation or an actual example of a triangle based on how closely it matches its essence. And then the thing is, once it's more fully as it is supposed to be, then it's more good. It's kind of if you will, the drawing of a triangle is aiming towards what an actual triangle is supposed to be with all of its features and so forth. So there's already kind of a teleological structure of aiming towards completion. And then the principle of finality, um, the principle of finality, you know, sometimes teleology is taken to be like extrinsic teleology. So for instance, like an intelligent design, or I mean, even in young earth creationism, right? Like the idea is that God imposes order onto the world and the world itself doesn't contain that order. The principle of finality actually says, no, no, no. In the world itself, you have a teleological structure where things are acting in accordance to their nature. So when a cause produces some effect, it's because the cause is supposed to produce that effect in question. <clears throat> so it's not just the case that you have efficient causes where X leads to Y, but also that X is supposed to lead to Y in some sense. There's, a, there's kind of a, a relationship between the efficient cause and the final cause, and together they make sense of each other. So for instance, like, you know, natural law theorists would not be humians. We wouldn't say that it's just a regularity that we're observing in nature, but things are doing just what they do by nature. That's the argument there. So how does this lead to God? Well, okay, so I'm not gonna go over the full arguments for the existence of God, because that would take way too long. So let me try to summarize each of these. So St. Thomas Aquinas had six famous ways of proving the existence of God. And I'm just going to cover three of them very quickly. So the Deante argument says the following. There is a real distinction between um, essence and existence. So for instance, uh, Fazer uses an argument to, dem uh, to defend this premise in Five Proofs of the Existence of God. And the idea is that, you know, when, when you, we offer a real definition of something, we're giving, kind of a, we're giving it a semantic kind of treatment. So for instance, um, let's say, you know, you have a unicorn, you have, uh, I think it was a Tyrannosaurus Rex, and you have, let's say, a giraffe. If you ask the kid to describe 
just based on the descriptions of each of the animals alone. So if you offered a real description of each of these animals, could the kid actually figure out which one currently exists, once existed, or never existed at all? Well, Fazer would argue no, because you can give each of these creatures meaningful real definitions or semantical treatments of them. So it seems to be the case that the essence of a creature itself does not secure its existence. Because I can offer a real definition, a full description of what a being is, that doesn't mean that it has to be in existence. So then Aquinas argues that there has to be an explanation for why beings with essences you know, who exist but don't have essences that necessitate their existence, why they exist in the first place. And Aquinas says in order to break this uh, causal regress, you're going to have to get to a being whose essence is existence, whose very nature is simply just to exist. So that's the De Ante argument. And if you run it with a convertibility principle, then you can get a being who's actually essentially perfect because existence or a fulfillment of sorts, being and goodness are convertible. So then this being would be essentially good. The first way is just the Aristotelian proof. So the idea is that the world is divided in act and potency and change is the actualization of an object's potential by an already actual actualizer. And the idea is that in order to break an infinite causal regress again, you need a being who is by nature just pure act. And the reason why you can have a being that's pure act, but not pure potentiality at least, is because potentiality is parasitic upon actuality. Actuality is the more fundamental of the two, even though the two both constitute reality as a whole. So that's the first way. We gotta get a purely active or act, uh, being a pure act. And then the fifth way is just a teleological argument. And the reason why I put it in here was just to get us to an argument that there has to be a being with the intellect in question. So it's not just perfectly good, but also has an intellect of sorts. So the fifth way um, looks at the world like this. We see that things in the world act towards certain ends. And it seems as if things in the world have you know, even organic and inorganic substances have this intentionality built into them, where they are striving towards certain ends rather than others. And Aquinas argues that the only thing that can actually um, direct, let's say, an inorganic, a thing without a mind, towards its end is a mind itself. So he uses the example like when you shoot an arrow. The arrow on its own cannot shoot itself towards its proper end, but with the guidance of an intellect, it can do the thing in question. So Aquinas is basically saying, uh, the world contains intentionality or teleology in it. And the source of this intentionality is probably a mind, since minds have feature, this feature of intentionality built into them already and can move and act upon other material substances. So uh, let's see here. I mean, and even in like the philosophy of mind, intentionality is now considered a part of consciousness, which is a pretty interesting thing to think about. So the natural law theory is the basic idea that there is no fact value distinction in nature, that nature is moving towards certain purposes and different beings have different purposes. There's a human good, there's an animal good, there's a good for, let's say, a plant, there's a good for, let's say, other creatures that exist and prowl about the earth. And the idea is that natural law theory is a study or is a study of how to fulfill your nature. So just to briefly run down the argument. First, we can begin the PSR. Human action has an intelligible structure to it where human beings act for intelligible reasons. And Aristotle in the beginning of politics says that every agent that acts, acts for what he takes to be good. So human beings act on the basis of what they take to be good and worthwhile. There's an intelligible structure to the action itself. Um, and this means then that human action itself is inescapably connected or motivated by the good. When we get into the second thesis about real essentialism, we would say that human beings by their natures and their faculties have certain uh, goal-directed ends that they're trying to accomplish, and this is just by virtue of being human. And the goal then of human beings when we instantiate ourselves or act in certain ways is to be fully human in the fullest sense possible so that we can achieve the highest rank of the human good. And that's how we get the convertibility principle, where as human beings become more fulfilled, as we have these appetites towards, let's say, friendship, towards community, we have appetites towards beauty, the natural law theorists would consider this to be part of the human good itself. Ben and I right now have an appetite towards knowledge, right? That's just something that is essential or key to being human itself. And as we pursue this, we are pursuing the human good. 
And then the principle of finality simply states that um, when we do this particular end, we're not acting in vain. We're acting for something that is within the structure of reality itself, the very purpose of what we're aiming towards. So then there is no fact value distinction. Science, or ethics rather just becomes a science of how to fulfill our natures. And then of course, there's like different principles you can develop like the, the doctrine of double effect. You can develop uh, the fundamental principle of natural law morality is to do good and avoid evil. And evil is considered a privation or a lack of what should be there of what should be fulfilled. And the should there is grounded in teleology. So that's a lot to take in at once. But the idea is that you can't have the natural law unless God exists, unless God created reality itself, and unless reality reflects the God who created it from the fullness of existence itself. So that's a lot to cover. But uh, yeah, I'm excited to see what Ben has to say. Okay, so I want to start with uh, formulation of Swan's moral argument because um, I don't have any objections to it um, as far as the form goes other than I think it could be simpler. So having six premises can be a lot to keep up with at one time and so I would propose um, reformulating this argument into the language, into modal language, the language of possible worlds, um, how we distinguish, you know, what is possible or necessary or contingent, um, things like that. Now, this object, this, this isn't an objection, but this might not go through because Swan mentioned earlier that he formulated, I believe he said it was the fourth premise, um, specifically, to respond to the Euthyphro dilemma. So if that claim being explicit in the form of argument helps understand the Euthyphro dilemma better, then perhaps the formulation of me putting it in the modal language won't be as helpful. I don't know, we'll have to see once we get to the Euthyphro dilemma. But the uh, way I formulate it um, is that, <coughs> excuse me, um, here, I got it written down right here. So the first premise, I would say necessarily. So in all possible worlds, moral truths imply theism. And I think that's a true, that's a claim that Swan would very readily grant. He would say that, 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 look, if we're going to have any kind of moral truths, then those moral truths depend necessarily on God. And then the second premise is just necessarily there are some moral truths. And so obviously he and I, this is the common ground. We come to the discussion both accepting this premise and so therefore it follows necessarily that theism is true. And so why do I formulate it like this? Why do I uh, prefer it um, in this type of formulation to rather than something like uh, Swan's formulation? Well, one, because I see the argument from evil and the moral, moral argument as two dueling arguments. So I see them as being able to um, concede um, a, a, a mutual premise. They would both agree that if theism is true, there are no unjustified evils. And then from there, we can make a case that's both a moral argument and one that's a problem of evil. And so then you can ask the, the key premises on each of those arguments. Um, in the case of the moral argument, the key premise is going to be um, moral truths imply theism. And the key premise on the problem of evil is going to be there are some unjustified evils. So what that helps for a discussion like Swan and I are having is to help people not talk past each other. Mm -hmm. What really matters, what these two arguments really turn on, if we're pitting these two arguments against each other, are the existence of unjustified evils on the atheist side. And the, on the theist side, it's the claim that moral truths somehow imply theism. And so that's the case I see Swan essentially making today for natural law theory. Why, does, why do moral truths imply theism? He can give a very straightforward answer that's not modified divine command theory. 
he can say, because of natural law theory, and he gives us, four, um, I, I, I can't emphasize enough how useful this is, he gives us four bullet points of basically just, hey, this is what is part of the theory. This is how, if we're trying to answer the question, if the theist is trying to answer the question or convince an atheist, hey, why do moral truths imply theism? Swan has a, a whole case right here packed into it. So we have to then compare it with a case on the other side, on the atheist side, my side, with something uh, Swan mentioned earlier that I'm an ethical non-naturalist. So I don't want to get too deep into the weeds, but I would like to lay out some of the essential concepts of this so that we can then move into a more substantive discussion about the moral argument and the problem of evil. So on my view, I make four essential claims as well. So, so I say that some things matter in a moral sense, and the first claim is going to be because there's, there are moral sentences that can be true or false. So this is a claim that Swan and I have in common. We both believe that we can make moral claims, and they can be true or false. It's, they're not like, you know, boo murder or um, lot, uh, commands of, a, you know, like close the door. They're not like that. They're intended to state propositions that can be true or false. So some form of cognitivism is true, to use the jargon. The second claim I make um, is that some of these moral sentences are true. So this is just a realist thesis of morality. And so I think this is, again, another claim that Swan would agree with, because we both agree that not only do we make moral claims that are intended to be true, but some of them are, in fact, true. So something like moral nihilism, uh, like an error theory, where all of our moral claims is false, that's a false view. Um, the third claim I make is one about objectivism. So this, this is where I think Swan, Swan and I could have some very serious conversa uh, conversation because we might both accept this claim, but we might cash it out in different terms because objectivity is a notoriously slippery subject. So this is where the claims really start. To, this is where we're really going to start to see where our disagreements arise. So I say that moral sentences are made true by properties other than attitudes or responses. So if we conceive of God as an attitude or response, and that he's, his attitudes or responses are what make moral sentences true, then that's a form of subjectivism. But I'm an objectivist. I think that moral truths are independent of any attitude or any response. So this might be an area where we have disagreement, or we might find that we have a whole lot more agreement than what we thought. And then the fourth claim is what may is the claim that's uniquely to unique to the ethical non-naturalist, and that's that moral properties are not identical to any set of non-normative properties. So Swan mentioned earlier that on his view, there is no distinction between facts and values. So that's the where my view disagrees with him very substantially. It says that well, there is a fundamental difference between statements of descriptive fact and statements of normative value. So how, do, how, how can we distinguish these things? So the easiest way that I've found to do it is to think of reason and morality and justification as being described within the logical space of reasons. Whereas causal things, the way when things bumping into one another, things that are studied by the natural sciences, like physics and chemistry and biology, and to an extent, if we're assuming that there is a theological domain to, to explore, even theologians would be included in this. Um, it's saying that that is the logical space of causes, that when we're trying to characterize a truth of that kind, we are putting it in the logical space of causes. And so the logical space of causes and the logical space of reasons are distinct. They cannot be reduced to one another which is one reason why my view is often called ethical anti-reductionism. So we can, we can 
think of Swan's view as reducing values to facts, whereas my view is insisting no, normative facts, values, evaluative claims, these things are distinct facts. There is, the, there is this own domain or realm of uniquely ethical facts. So how, th how might things matter in this sense? So what's essential to my concept of normativity and morality here is the concept of a reason. So a reason is difficult to explain or even to define um, because it's a primitive concept. So on my view, if we try, uh, the concept of a reason is indefinable, but we can't explain it by having people use it. So I like to give an equivalent concept which is the concept expressed by counts in favor. So if we say that something is a reason for us to act, we're saying that there is some consideration which counts in favor of us acting in some way. So, but counts in favor just means gives a reason for. So I'm not defining a reason here. I'm just saying it in different terms. Because what's unique here is I'm saying that it's irreducibly normative. The concept of a reason cannot be cashed out in wholly non-normative terms. You will have to make an appeal to an irreducibly normative concept like reason, counts in favor, good, bad, right, wrong, or relations like better than, best. Um, these are irreducibly normative concepts that can't be reduced to something non-normative. So that's going to be where I'm, I, my side is going to push back on Swan's view hardest, is to say that it's, it's gonna insist that no, we cannot reduce these facts to quote unquote, a natural law. So let's, I think this is a perfect point for us to just move into your slide here, just with the first, the, the principle of sufficient reason here. So you laid out the principle of sufficient reason, but you say within it, um, every event has a cause. So if we're talking about an explanation, with my view, there's the logical space of causes and there's the logical space of reasons. So we can have an explanation in the sense of causes, and we can have an explanation in the sense of reasons. So these are two distinct kinds of explanation. Since I'm making claims about the logical space of reasons, if this principle of sufficient reason is limited to the logical space of causes, it's completely irrelevant to my moral theory. It does not determine what I don't have to make appeal to it is what I'm saying. So whether or not the, the PSR is true or false is irrelevant to my uh, argument. Whereas it seems relevant to, to Swan's. So I'd like to let Swan just go ahead and take this opportunity. Is this principle of sufficient reason limited to causes or can we have irreducibly normative explanations? Mm. Yeah, so I mean, uh, let's see here. So, I mean, the, the first thing is to realize that um, when natural law theorists say there's no fact value distinction, right, they're not saying that any description of, let's say, the natural world is going to give you the moral law, right? So it has to be, um, Rob Coons in his book, Realism Regained, I think he calls this like teleosemantical statements. So these are statements about how things function. So if I just told you the sun is, you know, bright, that's not going to give you anything about the moral law. If I told you grass is green, right, that has no kind of normative moral content necessarily. I could, you could make it, you know, if you added a few more things into there. But if I say, for instance, like it is natural for human beings to, it is natural and fulfilling for human beings to pursue relationship, right? Then in that sense, then there would be no, like that's how the fact value distinction would be kind of be, removed so you know having the correct content is going to be important here it's not any statement of fact and then two teleology also bridges this uh, gap between let's say causes and reasons and i think this is actually a nice way of cashing it out so you know ben says the there's this let's say this causal order 
right? And this causal order is truly distinct from, let's say, this, the world of reasons, right? Because reasons aren't reducible down to these natural explanations, if you will. So I can or offer you, what'd you say? Or supernatural. Or supernatural, right? Yeah. So um, for instance, like the, the, the content of me saying, I should accept the conclusion of a true argument is not the same content as X leads to Y in the natural order. Like that just seems weird from the outset, right? So I would agree there. And the bridge that I would make is actually with teleology again. So I'd say that there's a, nat there's a, normati there's a normativity in nature. It's not necessarily moral normativity on its own, but because of the principle of finality, there's a way in which things tend to act. And that's because that is their intrinsic power or nature to do the thing in question. So then when it comes to reasons, right, reasons also have kind of this normative property where we should accept the conclusions of a true argument. And likewise, you know, the natural world, a cause should lead to its effect if it's uninhibited, right? That's the kind of semantical bridge you can maybe draw, make between the two. Um, another thing too is, uh, you know, um, with, with Rob Coons again, like, uh, you know, in his book, Realism Regained, when he makes this theory of causation, he connects it to the philosophy of mind. Because he believes that, you know, if I'm thinking about something in the world, then there has to be like information that's being transferred from the natural world into my intellect. And there has to be a reliable causal connection between my faculty and what it's processing in question. So the idea is that then causes and reasons, sure, they're, they're, they're individuated from each other by, let's say, their content, but they depend upon the same sort of teleological structure to be intelligible, to be reliable, and thoroughgoing, and so forth. Um, let me see here. So when it comes to the PSR, long-winded answer. Um, <laughs> when it comes to the PSR, um, the reason why I would say, I mean, so obviously, the PSR is connected to human action as well, right? Because if we're talking about causes, like, you know, let's say the effect of my decision right now to talk is that there are words coming out of my mouth and they have like, they, they intentionally have semantical content for Ben to process and think about, right? What is the cause of me making these statements? Well, it's my, I would say it's my intellect, right? Which is processing the, processing, processing the information in question and then conveying it through my faculty of speech. Right, so there is going to be a causal connection at least between my thoughts, my intellect, and what ultimately manifests in the external world, if you will. Um, yeah, so I would say that I wouldn't want to leave it out. And also, I mean, when I did my interview with Rob Coons on my channel the other day, um, you know, we talked about one of the objections to the PSR is that it seems to undermine human free will. But then, you know, we, we argued against that position. So people obviously have made the connection between the PSR and human action. So I would just say that um, with teleology, you can do both. Gotcha. So, because the, the, the reason I ask this question is um, because if the PSR is true or false, that has no implications for my argument. But if it's false, it does have implications for your view. Correct? So this is a way in which your view can be false, but in which mine can't be false. And I think that's something just important as a signpost to put there. Um, yeah, I mean like- um, Real essentialism. Mm. So this is the view that everything has a definite uh, essence or a real definition. Mm -hmm. So I will, will put another uh, signpost in this. So I don't have to make such a claim. And in, in the, the ethical non-naturalist doesn't have to make that claim. And I'm not saying this claim is false. Yeah. Um, we could say that we do have some reason to doubt it because uh, semantics seems plastic, uh, plastic. So the definitions of things change um, based on uh, uh, definitions of words seem to be dependent on how we use language. And I'm not saying that that's a decisive objection. It's just something to think of. Again, it's another way in which Swan's view might be false, but mine, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. This could be true. It could be false. It does not matter for my view. Um, the convertibility pr principle and the principle of finality would be the two that the, I think the atheist on my side would want to challenge. Um, the first one, the convertibility principle 
says that goodness is identical to being. So to me, this just seems like a way of reducing goodness to something non-normative. Reducing something normative, goodness, to something non-normative, being. So this is the exact kind of claim that the ethical non-natural seems to say, like, this cannot be true. This is like saying a river is identical to a sonnet. So this is our, I think this is our first claim of real substantive disagreement, where one of us is closer to the truth than the other. So I would say that the convertibility principle violates the is-ought gap, as it's typically called, that, uh, but that's not to beg the question against Swan, because Swan's already said his view is that there is no, that, you know what I mean? It's a, <laughs> yeah. This is mm -hmm. just how the two views are dueling. This is where the disagreement really is. Um, and then the fourth one is the principle of finality. And so that seems to uh, be incompatible with what the ethical non-naturalists would want to call moral autonomy. The idea of being able to self-govern our wills, where it seems as if our uh, what we should do morally um, is predetermined beforehand. In other words, we are merely like tools. We are for something. We have purposes and we can deviate from those purposes in good ways or bad ways, you know, converge in good ways, deviate bad ways, however we want to cash that out. So um, this is also the principle of finality, correct me if I'm wrong, is the claim that essentially says that the world is teleological. So the world might not be teleological. It might be teleological. Again, this is another one of those sign points I want to put, you know, put it like, this is a claim that Swan has to make, but it does not matter whether it's true or false for my view. It has no implications for my view. So why does all of this of what I've just said matter? I think it matters when we're going, we're about to go into a conversation about the moral argument and the problem of evil. And so we're saying which of these views helps us understand those problems better. Um, Swan has used a term that I've, I really like. It's an idea of unification. Uh, this is a way, the concept we're trying to express here is explanatory power. We want to be, I, already, I think I, went, I got ahead of myself on that. No, you're good. Keep on going. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'm, I'm trying to <laughs> bring it all together. So my claim um, I made four essential claims, and two of them Swan can accept right off the bat. The other two, one of them he definitely can't. The other, the other one is a little, we don't know yet. We'll have to discuss more whether we can resolve our disagreements there or not. The only way my view can be false is if my essential premise it, about reasons is false. If nothing matters in a reason implying sense, that is the only way my view can be false. So there's one unique way my view can be false, but I think there are four unique ways in which Swan's view can be false. So before we even get to the, to the considerations within the moral argument and the problem of evil, we can already see that I think Swan's view is more complex than mine because it ha it's less modest because it has more ways of being false. It makes more claims, but this is not a decisive consideration. This is an a priori consideration about theoretical virtues. We have to then go further into this, this discussion. This is again, signpost. It's just something for us to remember when we're trying to evaluate maybe likelihoods in something um, uh, having to do with either argument, because if that becomes the case, we have a priori considerations right now on the table. And so I'll let Swan, I've been talking for a little, I'll let you go ahead and respond to, to what you think of, think of that. Yeah, I mean, so obviously I think like natural law theory you know, one of the things that kind of pushes some people away is that some people think, oh, you're trying to do too much, right? Like um, for your position, it's just like, oh, well, you know, let, let's just take some premises that we all agree on, some things that just seem really obvious, right? 
and then we don't have to make all these other fancy commitments. Um, so I would say that the reason why natural law theory tends to be so complex, if you will, is because it's trying to cover everything. So yeah, it's, okay. yeah. It's a it, perfect it, place for to, to move into that concept. Yeah, so Look, I, I set it up for you. Yeah, I know, I know. All right, so then <laughs> we can just move on then to the slide. All right. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's do that. All right, so the slide here, more realism is true only if God exists. This is probably the more controversial premise of the whole argument, and it's going to be a fun one to discuss. So I have this, I have this argument or this, this, <clears throat> this um, intuition, if you will, that more realism must be comprehensively intelligible because it necessarily depends upon a compelling account of causality and ontology. So throughout Ben's presentation, you know, Ben tries to avoid making really strong ontological claims. He's not trying to make any significant ontological commitments about causality. He's just saying, look, here are the reasons that we have. And we have this like feature of <clears throat> counting in favor of just built into the way in which we think about things already. So we don't have to really like take into consideration the causal order and all the other stuff that Swan is interested in. And I'd say actually, no, you do. It, you know, it's almost inescapable. So here's why. So first, if we're going to argue from like, we have reliable faculties, then we're going to need some sense of cognitive normativity in order to be able to say, all right, so when exactly do we know that someone's faculty of reasoning is functioning properly? And here, this is going to depend upon some type of idea of norm, like, well, your faculty should be producing this belief, right? And then there has to be an explanation for where this normative feature comes from. So I think I, I, would be, I would make the argument that maybe Ben takes this for granted, especially when we look at then the second point on causal reliability. So I made the point that, you know, whenever we think about something, we're thinking about something in the world itself, usually speaking. Sometimes we're thinking about abstract concepts as well. But there has to be a reliable connection between the information that's in the world and then the information that's being processed within our intellects. It can't be the case that you know, maybe that thing, I'm seeing things as they are, or maybe, you know, the, the, the informational content is just unreliably being given to me. Maybe I have right opinion, but I don't ever have knowledge truly. So a get your problem, right? These are things that you want to avoid. You want to ensure that you have a reliable cognitive faculty that also has a reliable causal connection to the world and the informational content that's there. The other thing, too, is just like the semantical plausibility of ethical naturalism and functionalism. So if you look into the work of Philippa Foote, especially, I think she makes this point quite well, that even though most people, at least during her time, and I think even now maybe uh, the case holds true, you know, rejected uh, or accepted the fact-value distinction, Philippa Foote made the argument that actually, no, there's something significant about nature's role in making sense of what's good. So for instance, like when we use this concept of harm, we're implying that there's a way that things should be. When I say that, oh, I have a bad hand or my heart's not doing well, I'm implying this normativity that's built within nature itself. And um, Philippa Foote would make the argument that you, you basically need these basic concepts of how things should function, how things should be, in order for when you process them in your intellect and make these moral judgments, that there's something there's actual content, if you will, for it to process. So for instance, when I'm, when I'm processing that Ben shouldn't harm me, right? I'm not just, it's not a purely intellectual thing that I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about the reality of, let's say, the way that my body should be functioning, right? So it, the two are connected together. That's the basic point I'm making. And then when you look at, you know, David Otterberg's argument and other convertibility principle arguments, it just seems as if it's so natural for us to speak in this way. So then the point would be, well, look, if this is there, this natural kind of um, way in which we talk about things and we want to ensure that, you know, uh, let's say this is another point on the other slide or on the other 10 principles or standards for judging moral arguments. Like we want to ensure that we have a reliable way of speaking about the world and connecting these ideas, uh, the information into thoughts and so forth. So it seems as if this is a very natural thing for us to do. And it's going to be kind of difficult if you just say, well, no, there's no connection between the two at all. It's just something that we naturally develop, if you will. And then the last thing is the oneness of reality. And this is a point that I think Ben really liked a lot. So the oneness of reality is this idea that, look, if we're going to offer a moral theory, right, and we're going to offer in this account of moral realism, and we recognize that moral realism depends upon 
us also having reliable cognitive faculties, having a reliable connection between the outside world and the, the information content, if you will, entering our intellects. And we see that it's just so natural for us to speak, and it seems almost essential for us to speak of normativity in nature in order to even do the enterprise of ethics intelligibly. Then whatever explanation we offer for our thesis of moral realism, it has to include all of that in. The explanands has to include this set of explanandum, to put it a little bit more fancy. So then to put a sub-argument here, I would make the argument that non-theistic accounts of morality, one, they, they lack comprehensiveness um, in the sense that I've described with explaining all of this under one unified umbrella. And then second, if you don't have comprehensiveness, then your view kind of goes out the window. It, it, it's not explaining something that really needs to be there in order for you to have an intelligible account of moral realism. That's the contention there. So then we can make the point stronger if we can also cite 10 different standards by which we can measure these arguments. So for instance, one is just intuitive fit, and I think like Ben and I both have that. The second is empirical adequacy, right? And then all of this is really coming from Rob Coons's work, but you know, um, how, how should I put it? Um, Rob Coons recognizes that other theorists in other different areas with different convictions are also realizing that there is a connection between causation, teleology, the mind, values, and norms, and so forth. So this isn't just Rob Coons over in the corner just writing this book, right? And this is an idea that he's thinking about. Even, in fact, a lot of these um, metaphysical um, standards that he's setting forward are found in, uh, in other parts of the literature. But anyway, so there's empirical adequacy, there's semantical reliability, epistemic access, metaphysical fecundity, uh, unification, simplicity, normativity, applicability, and competitiveness. So eight and nine are more specific to morality itself. So it's just saying a proper moral theory should have an explanation for how it grounds ought statements and why departure from a norm is bad or something one ought not to do. Applicability just means that we can take the moral theory and actually apply it to our everyday problems. So it's not going to be the case that I have this account of goodness, and then it literally doesn't help us make any progress on figuring out what's right and wrong. And then the rest kind of flows in if you recognize that, you know, you can't escape these ontological commitments, or at least touching on causality in metaphysics. So uh, the argument that I would just make here is that natural law theory is built upon the Aristotelian Thomas synthesis, and you can actually construct a very compelling account of mind a very compelling account of causation. So like, for instance, cognitive normativity, insert the principle of finality, combine it with real essentialism. It was within human nature to have this faculty of reason. And the whole point of the faculty of reason is to be aimed at truth, because that's part of the human good. That's what's fulfilling for our faculties. And that's the norm, if you will, that's built into nature. Cause of reliability. Um, so basically, because all of reality has this unification to it, and all of reality is intelligible and it has this normativity built into it, we can trust, generally speaking, the information that's coming to us because nature and the causal order has a norm, a way that it ought to function or usually does function. And then for me, the, the semantical plausibility of ethical naturalism and functionalism, yeah, you know, let's bring it, you know, and then incorporate into my view. It's very natural. It fits in quite nicely. We're recognizing just something intrinsic to the world itself. And then when you combine this with the oneness of reality, natural law theory and the metaphysical principles that it's built upon can have empirical adequacy. So Rob Coons, Alexander Pruss, uh, I think Bruce Simpson in the book um, Neo-Aristotelian uh, Neo Perspectives on Contemporary Science, they make this argument that the same metaphysical principles that natural law theory is built on can also be applied into science, into quantum mechanics, and actually make sense of a lot of those areas. So uh, just to make the point short and sweet, um, this is a metaphysical theory of everything. And it takes the oneness of reality very seriously. And it says that, look, because moral realism is part of the reality of the world and moral realism is connected to the causal reality of the world and the causal reality of the world is connected to all sorts of various other things like the fundamental ontology of the world. Natural law theory is built upon this metaphysical hypothesis or theory that can explain all of this under one very beautiful, neat umbrella. So hence, simplicity, unification, you have metaphysical fecundity, um, and then epistemic access, that's there as well, and so on and so forth. You have the whole package. 
And that's the argument I'd make that my account is comprehensive, Ben's account isn't. Hold on, unmute your mic. Do we want to move into the Euthyphro dilemma now? Because so this yeah. pretty sets a, this sets us up for the moral argument. Because obviously, so actually, no. Before we move into that, mm -hmm. um, so because the, the premise that I'm trying, there, there's a specific premise that I'm trying to attack, and that um, premise is that moral truths imply the existence of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I've already mentioned one um objection which was the is ought objection is and so if we looked at your um claim that goodness is um oh, what was it I don't the convertibility know. principle the convertibility the convertibility principle thank you yeah um goodness is the same as being um so i think that that's a, a straightforward violation of the is odd gap so I think that there's a normativity objection here to say that this can't be the case for the same reason that rivers can't be the same thing as suns. So again, this argument might not convince a whole lot of people um, because your intuitions of how you face the fact value question will depend on your prejudices coming to the question. So the other argument that I put forward against a claim like this um, would be what I call the triviality obje objection. So the trivi triviality objection is that if per impossible Swan's view was, in tr was true, assuming that the normative trivity objection doesn't go through and that per impossible was true, then all of our moral claims would be trivial. And so how, do, how, do, how, how can I give an example of that? So I think the easiest way to do it would be to say, okay, take the essential claim to theism that God is morally good. But we've already said that goodness just is being. So if we say that God is goodness, all the only fact that we're actually stating is that God is being. Well, we both know that there's being, things can exist that are both desirable and undesirable. And the claim God is good and the fact that it states does not help us decide. So the claim, the, the, the philosophically and theologically important claim God is good would state a trivial fact. That point. It would not state a moral fact. And that's a problem. So that's, I would first put forward the normativity objection and then put forward the triviality objection. Now I think it's a good time to move into the Euthyphro dilemma because I think that these are lessons that can be taught to us by the Euthyphro dilemma and you have responses to the Euthyphro, Euthyphro dilemma. Do yeah. You <laughs> Do you want me to lay out the, le I'll lay out the youth of the road dilemma and then you lay out responses. Sure, sure. So um, to just sum up the youth of road dilemma. So again, the premise that I'm trying to criticize here or attack or however we want to characterize it um, is that moral truths imply the existence of God. And so I say that no, morality does not plausibly depend on God. Why? Um, and the reason why is because if there is no reason for issuing one command rather than another, uh, or God acting in one way rather than another, the morality would be arbitrary. But if there is a reason for God to issue some command rather than another, or act in some way rather than another, then morality does not depend on God, but instead on that reason. Either way, morality does not plausibly depend on God. So that's as concisely as I can formulate the Euthyphro dilemma. So the first horn, um, if we suppose there are no reasons such that God should not act in certain ways rather than others, then there would be no moral justification for anything God does. God's nature and commands would be morally arbitrary. 
there would be no moral difference in God commanding us to love one another and commanding us to eat each other. Since there is a moral difference between God commanding us to love one another and eating, a, eating each other, this view cannot be true. So to give an example using Swan's view, um, he uses um, the example, let me find it. Are you in the youth pro slide? I am not. Hang on one second. All Sorry, right. guys. Now you're good. Uh, well, well, while Ben's trying to find that, uh, Ben Watkins, I think this is on really atheolo Real Atheology's website. He has these excellent discussion briefs that are really nice and summarize kind of his position and how the conversation should go. So that's a really valuable resource. All right, so did you find it? the one where you say yeah. that there's this, ah, oh, the symmetry principle. There. Ah, okay. So we're going to that slide. All right. <laughs> well, the Euthyphro dilemma. Yeah, yeah. So this is, it's on the Euthyphro, the symmetry principle says God's actions cannot contradict thee. Yeah. We're already said that God, that goodness just is being. Yeah. And so we can imagine a world where God creates nothing but creatures whose talos is to eat each other. And then by your second thing here, God uh, intentionally creates creatures of kind to intentionally eat each other, but then creates them in a world where it never obtains. Well, that seems like it would be a good thing. But then right after that, it says, but even if one creature of K obtains, then God has acted consistently. So according, on this view, God could consistently be, create humans such that they have this talos to try to eat each other. And if at least one person eats someone else, then God has acted inconsistently. So this is the arbitrariness objection for the euthypro. This is why the arbitrariness horn is worrisome. The second horn is basically that morality is a function of reason rather than authority. So if we're talking about someone, God's commands, for example, if he has a reason for them, that's why you should obey the command is because there's some sort of reason. But then if there's this reason, then it doesn't depend on God. So either way, either horn that we try to tackle, we come to the conclusion that Either way, morality does not plausibly depend on God. I think this is the perfect part for you to come in to challenge what I'm saying. All right. All right. <laughs> right. So, I mean, um, man, there's a lot to say, but let's just, let's just go right in. So, right. So I tried to keep it to two horns. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Wait, there's more? No, I'm <laughs> all right. So, uh, yeah, the youth pro dilemma. So Ben kind of picked up on this, but like, I think it's a false dilemma. Right. So, you know, the argument is that to summarize again, right, there's either a, stand, a standard of goodness that's beyond God, which means that God's kind of irrelevant to goodness itself. Right. Maybe he's just also a participant in it, but it's not he's not terribly relevant. Right. So then all the moral arguments would kind of be significantly weakened. The other idea is that if God exists and all goodness is, is just dependent upon his divine commands then he could technically in principle command anything and that would be good. So that, that doesn't seem to actually be a necessary, you know, moral truth, if you will. It's just kind of on the whims of God. So then my answer would be that goodness is God's essence or nature. So how do I ground this claim? So one is that if you accept the convertibility principle and then you go back to the De Ente and first way arguments, God's essence is existence. So God's very nature is being, it is essentially goodness. If you, then apply the, the, the convertibility principle. And then the first way where God is pure act, pure fundamental reality, then goodness simply is, any instantiation of goodness in the world is simply imitating its perfect instantiation, which is God himself. That's the argument there. Now, there, like, so sometimes I've noticed that some theists just kind of say, all right, here's the third option, and then they run away. They kind of do like a hit and run argument, right? Where they think like this, the, the whole problem's done. No, I don't think it is. So here's my account of perfect being ethics. So one is the metaphysics of authority. So I have two ways of conceiving of, um, of 
authority. And both of them deal with fundamentality. So that's the concept, fundamentality. But two lenses of fundamentality being superiority and rational desirability. So for instance, um, you know, if we take like a social contract theory of government and society, right? One of like, you know, if we're going to take like a strong Hobbesian stance, or we don't have to, but for instance, um, the reason why you should obey the law, right, is because, or John Locke, it, the reason why you should obey the law is because the law was created for everyone's benefit in the social contract, right? So then if you really do want you know, the preservation of your property, the preservation of your life, then you actually do fundamentally depend upon there being civil order. And if you do an action that's against civil order, then you're actually doing something <clears throat> self-defeating. So you're undermining something upon which you depend, fundamentally speaking. And that thing upon which you depend has a superiority over you. That's a fundamentality of superiority, one way to view authority. The other way is to view it as rational desirability. So going back to the social contract example, right? Locke would say, you have actually very good reasons to want to preserve your life and your property. And when you act against the civil order, when you act in a way that is uh, against order and violates, let's say, you know, everyone else's life and property, then you're doing something that is actually self-contradictory. And there is this natural innate desire within human beings to be like to, to follow what is rationally desirable. So you're doing an action technically that you don't actually want to do. You're kind of acting on these really bad and inconsistent motivations. So then the idea is that once again, authority is just simply it's superiority or this thing that you fundamentally depend upon. And then also it's the thing that you want to depend upon, right? You have very good reasons to want to depend upon it. So then, I mean, in the case of God, right, like you fundamentally depend upon God for your existence and everything that is good is merely an imitation of him. So then if you think that those things are good, then you have a reason to desire the source or the perfection or the fundamental reality from which they come from, which is God himself. So that's just, this is why God has fundamental authority in the moral domain. Now, how do we avoid arbitrary commandments? So the symmetry principle states God's at, and I added this on later to kind of make it more clear. So I'm sorry, Ben, I added the little part near the end of the sentence. So, all right, cool. So then, so then the idea of the symmetry principle is that God's actions cannot contradict being through unfaithfulness, perversion, or unintelligibility. All of these are different ways in which you can undermine being itself. So what do I mean? So unfaithfulness. So I take unfaithfulness as something like the following. So I use this example where God intentionally creates creatures of kind K with telos T, but creates them in a world where T never obtains. So God's like saying, you know, I created you to be in communion with me, but guess what? I'm not going to actually help you at all when you fall. You know, I'm just going to let you be. And I'm going to let all of you guys actually fail. I'm going to create you all with this telos, with this purpose. And guess what? It's not actually going to ever be obtained. It's never going to actually have any being to it. So I created you with a telos without being. That would be a fundamental contradiction. Um, a perversion. So if God lies, for instance, then God, who is the source of goodness itself, right? And then the idea is that one of the goods that we pursue, that we act upon is truth itself or is knowledge. So then God would be making an assertion and an assertion is supposed to be in principle or by nature oriented towards truth. And God tells a lie, which is the opposite of truth. So he's perverting his own faculty of assertion making, if you will. So that's a contradiction. The other thing is unintelligibility. So if God acts for no reason at all, right, then like, you know, for instance, someone makes this counterexample, like, oh, imagine if God, um, you know, formed this person for 30 seconds to exist in total utter suffering and tortures them and then wipes them out of existence. You know, that's a counterexample. And I'd say, no, 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 no. Because if we have to, if, God's actions are intelligible because he is being itself and so forth, then what reason would he have to act and do that thing in question? And if there is no reason, then there is in a way no being to the act itself. Uh, so Robert George in his lecture on, I think it was natural law, human dignity and God, he uses this example, right? So he says, imagine if during, in the middle of my lecture, I start scratching my head and jumping up and down. And then you ask me, well, why are you doing this? And I, and I literally say, no reason at all. 
and it's not even, I don't, it's not even that I feel like doing it. There's n absolutely no reason at all. Then that would be a very fundamentally unintelligible state of affairs. And one thing to keep in mind as well, um, this might be worth discussing if we're going to look at God's intellect. For the natural law theorists, like when a being thinks about something, right? Like, you know, let's say I think about my cup that's in front of me. The, the idea of the cup, something about the cup itself now has existence in my mind. It has a kind of being to it. And the reason why like natural law theorists and Aristotelian Thomas stress being so much is because they're trying to avoid, I think it was Zeno's charge, that the reality of change implies that non-being produces being, right? That, that's the charge they're trying to avoid. They're trying to say that, no, of all in, in the, this domain of all the things that exist, there is always going to be some type of transaction of being, if you will, in one form or another. So that's a little complicated. We can talk about that. But reason itself has being to it. That's the point that I'm trying to make. So God never acts for no reason, absolutely no reason at all. So that would be a contradiction to the symmetry principle. Now, uh, Ben, uh, let's see here. Let me hit the counterexample later. Okay, yeah. So then, I mean, the supremacy of God thesis is just basically the only requirement upon God is that he does not violate the symmetry principle. So you'd have to demonstrate that somehow God in, I don't know, let's say the problem of evil or in some other counterexample fundamentally violates being itself. And like it's irreparably counterintuitive. Uh, yeah, we can talk about that later too in the next slide. And then the clarification. So, you know, sometimes natural law theorists, they say that God isn't a moral agent. And the idea is that uh, the re when, when, when natural law theorists say that, or sometimes they say God doesn't have moral obligations, that isn't terribly accurate. It's a bit misleading, but it's still nonetheless true. So the idea of like, for instance, you know, Ben and I have obligations to each other, at least on my view, qua human being. So by virtue of being of the same genus and with a specific difference, we have responsibilities that distinctly human beings share with one another. On the other hand, because God, you know, is fundamentally ontologically superior to us, our obligations, not there, the obligations that he has are not grounded in us, right? It's not the case that, let's say, um, you know, be, be, uh, God has an obligation to not, right, let everybody go to hell, qua my humanity. Nope, that's not where the, that's not where the source of obligation comes from. It comes from God himself. Likewise, I mean, if, to use another point um, on this Aristotelian chain of being, you know, I don't have the same obligations that I have to Ben as I do to an animal, right? Um, we, we might have the same obligation in different ways, perhaps, but like, for instance, it's okay for me, presumably, to eat an animal. It's not okay for me to eat Ben, right? That's one way. Also, I have the right to put animals in cages and treat them humanely, if you will, because we both have the animal nature we both don't deserve to be treated arbitrarily, right? And, but there are certain things that I can do that I can't do to an equal. That's the point that I'm trying to make. So then when it comes to God, God treats us certain ways, not because the obligation is generated from our being, but because it's generated from his being. Now, okay, um, Ben used this counterexample of let's say God gave everybody the telos to eat each other, right? Well, according to natural law theory, the most fundamental basic good of human pursuit um, is life itself. So um, there, there's a paper that uh, Rob Coons has titled The Metaphysics of Property, where he discusses this sort of issue. And he says, like, life has the highest ontological priority because all other goods that you and I can achieve are fundamentally dependent upon this first actualization of potential, our potential to exist and continue existing. Another defense of it, you can find it in David Otterberg's book, uh, Moral Theory, where basically, like, if you take this metaphysics of authority seriously, the one that I've laid out, and then you recognize that life is the most fundamental basic good, then life in some way has an authority over all the other goods that you could wish to pursue. Um, let's see here. Alan Gaworth in his book, Reason and Morality, makes a similar case to this end. So the point is that God could not command us to, let's say, eat each other. On the other hand, if you think the death penalty is permissible, then you, it's possible to make a case that it's permissible for God to tell us to kill each other on the basis of there being some intelligible reason, 
right? And that's still kind of vague. I mean, so one would have to be like cases that deserve death that are worthy of capital punishment. That would be like the only scenario that I could think of that would preserve the structure of being. This is kind of long-winded. I'm sure you guys want to hear what Ben has to say. So that's my summary. <laughs> no, I think it was, I think it was great. Um, so I'll try to keep this part short so that we can move on into the problem of evil too. Um, so the places where I would want to push back would be to insist that the youth of road dilemma is a real dilemma and that there is no genuine third option. And so I would, that's why I phrase it in terms of there is a reason for issuing a command or acting in some way, or there is not a reason. So there either is a reason or there's not a reason. So those are two binary ways of thinking about it. And so to, in order to attack, you have to pick one of the horns. But the third option, according to, to Swan, is that there are reasons for God's, for the way God acts. Um, so they're not arbitrary. Um, but these reasons are also not independent of God in some way. So morality still essentially depends on God and that these reasons are also morally important. So depending on how Swan was responding to that, I would, I would you know, say, uh, no, these aren't actually moral, uh, the, or you might be borrowing a uh, claim from the non-naturalist, like in your response just now where you were saying, life is the basic good. Well, my view would just say, look, everyone has a reason to care about life because life is intrinsically valuable in a reason implying sense. God couldn't command us to eat each other because life is good. God is perfectly good. So he can't do something like that. But this implies that the goodness of life is independent of God. It is something essential to the nature of life itself. It's a fact about life. It's not a fact about God. So that's one way uh, that I would, I would try to um, push back on the responses um, to the Euthyphro dilemma. Um, the other thing that I would want to mention here just very quickly is, Swan mentioned it, the idea that on the Thomistic view, God is not a moral agent. So I always find this a very strange claim. And I was happy to hear Swan kind of uh, concede that a little bit and say like, look, this can be misleading, but it is in some sense true. Because what I would want to do is, is, is focus on the implausibility of that. Because again, to use the example, we say that God is perfectly good, perfectly moral. Well, what does that mean? Well, it, to me, that means that God fulfills all of his moral obligations, has an unsurpassable set of character virtues, and would care about the types of value that are in the world. That's what we mean by a moral agent, or God being morally perfect. He's a, a, an agent in the sense that he has a mind, and he can make decisions uh, he can decide between alternatives. He can make decisions for reasons. But why is he a moral agent? Well, because those decisions have effects on other moral agents. They affect the relations of people. They're not in his relation to rocks. They're, rela they're a relation to things, other things that matter. He, we are other moral agents. We aren't merely moral patients. And so... God would have to treat us in certain ways. He would have to have certain attitudes towards us if he was to warrant a title like morally perfect. Because again, remember that the property of moral per perfection for the theologian is doing a lot of work for them because that's the property that makes it the case that God would be wholly worthy of our worship. Why, should, why, why, is, it, why is it some less than perfect being worthy of our worship. The reason why is because God is, the reason why God is wholly worthy of our moral, uh, is because he's morally perfect through and through. And so that's how I would push on the implausibility of saying that God is not a moral agent. At that point, I don't know how to distinguish the Thomistic God from an agentless 
type God of pantheism like Spinoza. Like Spinoza would say, look, you know, God doesn't act in the way humans act. He acts, you know, differently. He acts like nature. And it's not an intentional will, so to speak. I don't know how to make sense of God not being a moral agent. I take that for granted. Um, do th is now a good time to move into the problem of evil? Yeah. Before we go, though, I think like just some clarification will help us on this slide moving into the problem of evil. So one of like the fundamental theses um, of like scholastic metaphysics, so to use a shorter term for Aristotelian and Thomas metaphysics, scholastic metaphysics, is that action follows being, right? So a being can only act in accordance with their nature. That's like the basic idea. So for instance, like um, when it comes to God and the symmetry principle, that's the fundamental scholastic principle that idea is built upon. I just try to make it sound a little more fancy and aesthetically pleasing. Um, and then the second point was that, yeah, so the source of the, the, the source of morality itself, right? Um, or how, let's see here, where can I go with this? Yeah, I mean, just uh, so Chris Tolson, even though he's a new natural law theorist and us classical natural law theorists kind of have beef with them, um, Chris Tolson makes this point that I think is quite good. And even Otterberg makes it too. And the idea is that morality as the science of how to fulfill your nature, right? It first depends upon there being the good, right? And then morality becomes scientific, if you will, when you have to figure out how do I pursue the good, right? And using practical reason, how do I, you know, what laws and moral principles do I need to make? And because reality is intelligible, these principles should apply when their sufficient conditions are there and so forth, right? So um, how, do I, how do I put this? The, 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 the idea is that one way that you could say that God isn't a moral agent is because Technically, God doesn't have to speak of figuring out, right? How should I act in this situation? Because God, being omniscient, right, he already knows all things. So, like, he just already in, in, in instantaneously grasps how to act in certain situations, right? And this is why um, Thomas, and this is going to help us in the next slide, this is why Thomas say that God's relationship, when we speak of him, we can't speak of him univocally, so our language is not perfect. It's not going to perfectly get the whole essence of God himself because he's so fundamentally superior to us. We can speak of him analogically. And I think, um, I think it was Moses Maimonides who made the point that you can speak of God through negation. So God is not like this. God is not like that. But God is like this. But it's very difficult to say God is, uh, is X, right, without any ambiguity. That's the point. There's going to have to be some analogy there. So to the problem of evil. So um, do you want me to set it up or do you? Got sure, it? you set it up. Okay. Um, the one thing I want to say, I think you made a really great dis distinction that might help. The, um, the science of how to fulfill your nature or what God wants for us. So a, gr a great way to, and I wish I had said this earlier, to contrast our two views is that Swan's view is the science of how to fulfill what God wants for us, whereas my view is the science of trying to answer the question, what ought we do? So these are fundamental uh, differences in our view. My view is a question, whereas Swan's view assumes that there is something that, that, that the ethics of what it will, there is some nature to fulfill, and we know what that nature is. We cannot even begin our ethical enterprise until we know that end. We can't begin it correctly. Um, so with the, I think that's a really good way of contrasting our views. I wish I had said that earlier. Um, but onto the problem of suffering. So yeah. suff suffering and circumstances of injustice raise the question of whether or not the world contains undesirable states of affairs that count against theism. Notice I say the count against it gives us reason to believe theism is false. Another example of how I'm using that concept of a reason here. Do the kinds, amounts, and distributions of evil count against believing in a being who has the knowledge, power, and motivation to prevent them? So the atheist, I think um, that the argument from evil is sound. And so that if I make the very simple case that theism implies there are no unjustified evils, which is something all parties can concede. Um, there are some unjustified evils, 
And there are some moral truths, like we said in our moral argument earlier, and what my position has been, if those three things are all the case, then it follows that theism is false, that moral truths do not imply theism, and that the moral argument is unsound. So I think it's a really good exercise for us to, to kind of dual pit these two arguments against each other because so much turns on so little and we can really concentrate on those cases. So right now, uh, the way I see things is that the, essential, the question of even the moral argument from my perspective right now is going to turn on the existence of unjustified evils. I think there is sufficient reason to believe that the world contains some unjustified evils, whereas Swan is going to maintain, no, the world does not contain any unjustified evils. Well, just what is an unjustified evil? Well, an unjustified evil is obviously something evil, something that's intrinsically undesirable. But um, an unjustified evil is a state of affairs, a being such as God would not be justified in allowing. So these are logically opposed to each other in the sense that theism must imply there, there aren't these things. I defined it this way so that that premise uh, Swan and I could unambiguously share. There's not some hidden or packed into this principle. This is just a straight up logical say, unjustified evils are logically incompatible with the truth of theism. So the world is uh, full of suffering. The distribution of it appears mostly random. Um, for example, there's circumstances of injustice involving the intense suffering of creatures that are morally innocent. So I'll give just three examples real quick and then I'll, let, I'll turn it back over to Swan. Um, so there are human infants um, with terminal diseases um, whose parents must helpfully look on as they pass on. There are non-human animals that have languished in the state of nature struggle for survival for millions of years. And some people suffer so horrendously they come to believe their lives are no longer worth living. Mm -hmm. So I think these are three different kinds of uh, suffering, intense suffering of morally innocent creatures that are prime candidates for being unjustified evils. And so I'll turn it back over to Swan now because I think this is really where the meat of our, we, we've, we've spent a good amount of time discussing his key premise of moral truths implying theism. But now we're going to turn to, to my key premise of uh, there are some unjustified evils. And so what I would encourage um, other truth seekers to um, think about in this is which case is stronger? Which case do they do you think is more plausible? Do you think that there's a stronger case that um, moral truths imply theism, or do you think that there's a stronger case that there are some unjustified evils? And this, I think, this is a, an incredibly powerful tool for both atheists and theists both to use to get clearer about their own thinking. So, I'll turn it back over to you now. Yeah, I mean, I, I really like what Ben's saying here, too, because I, I get annoyed when some Christian apologists, sorry, every single point, you know, when I begin, I'm always bashing some Christian apologists. I'm trying to... No, 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 no you're fine. You're, <laughs> you're laying out mistakes that you don't want other truths to see. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, I mean, you know, sometimes people, you know, when they, uh, you know, like, you raise the problem of evil, and you, you obviously say, like, how can a good God allow this? And then the Christian apologist says, well, look, you need objective moral values and duties, and objective moral values and duties come from God. And I'm like, that doesn't actually really help. Because there's a serious, like, if you will, um, I don't know if this is the proper word, like, this, this dissymmetry, if you will, like, this, there, there's a serious kind of uh, disproportionality going on here. So you can't well, just... Can, yeah. can I, can I uh, come to the defense of the apologist? Oh, no, Ben. <laughs> you sunk to a new low. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that the theist has a very powerful case here in that they can concede. The yeah. I was talking about the theism implies there are no unjustified evils. There are some moral truths. Obviously, that's the... And then now the all-important claim that you're going to defend um, there are no unjustified evils. And so if that's the case, so if theism implies there are no justified evils, there are some moral truths, and moral truths imply theism, 
like you were arguing earlier, mm -hmm. then what's the conclusion of that? Theism is true. There are no justified evils. So the argument from evil is unsound. Mm, yeah, yeah. So by just making your case before and combining it with that can be used to say, no, the atheist must be making some mistake. Mm -hmm. This is just a Morian shift. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. It's a really powerful tool that apologists and atheists don't take enough advantage of. Yeah, so let me rephrase it like this. Um, it's, I feel like when you approach the problem of evil and then you say that, in my opinion, it just comes off as like rhetorically maybe insensitive or like, it, you know, I don't know how to put it, but it just, it comes off kind of odd. I will. think it's misguided. I think yeah, it, yeah, okay. it's misguided because there's a better Morian shift. Mm. And once you see that better Morian shift, that other way of presenting it just doesn't, it's why would we even use that before? Let's just use the Morian shift. And okay. let's, let's, you know, dispense with burdens of justification and just let evidential chips fall where they may. Like that's what I think is just super useful about this method. All right. All right. Well, let me just get right down to business then. So yeah, the problem of evil, it, you know, you could make a kind of emotional problem of evil. And perhaps this is what I mean. Like if you just say, you know, you bring in the moral argument and you're talking about the emotional problem of evil, that's not going to be really helpful to somebody. Right. Ah, yeah. Right that might be a better way of recashing re out what I was saying. Yeah. But gotcha. you know, so there's the emotional problem of evil where there's a serious like emotional punch to seeing like a child suffering, to seeing natural evils in the world, cancer and earthquakes and so forth. Things that just actually by nature, if you will, just don't seem to make sense. And I think the, the, the strongest ways to frame the problem of evil are exactly as Ben has described, where there's something unintelligible, something that just literally does not make sense at the end of the day between this instance of evil and the claim that God is good and that he created the world. There, there seems to be a huge rift between the two propositions. So I would agree there that that needs to be addressed. So one is that now I'm going to invoke the supremacy of God thesis. And I'm going to say that one evil in principle cannot undermine the goodness of God. So this is a point that I remember like David Bentley Hart kind of mentioned, but he kind of shooed it away and then Brian Davies picked it up. So the idea is this, um, you know, and I use different analogies, but God, if it, if it is true that God is subsistent being itself, he is fundamentally good and his essence is just existence itself. And then when you look at nature and you see privations, you see like, you know, the, the normative order sometimes being violated or suppressed. That would be like saying, um, yeah, the sun is not terribly bright. I'm not going to go blind if I look at it for, let's say, three minutes. Instead, and I know this to be the case because, look, there are shadows around me. Well, then it's like, well, no, no, no. The, the truth of the shadows being there does not negate the truth of the sun's brightness and majesty and glory. Uh, to use another example, right, like, let's say, you know, you have an artist like Michelangelo presents you the Pieta and it's beautiful. And then someone says, no, it can't be beautiful because look at all these other ugly works of art. Well, there's something in principle different between the two such that the ugly works of art don't attack Michelangelo's perfect work of art and the shadows themselves don't attack the brightness of the sun, if you will. So that, that's, a first prem, that's a first argument I'd put down. Like we should probably, like the, the problem of evil cannot in principle disprove the existence of God. The second claim is that God's omnibenevolence need not be equibenevolence in order to be compatible with the symmetry principle. So uh, equi, equibenevolence is this term that I think Paul Helm coined in the Cambridge Companion to the philosophy of religion. And the idea is that um, the problem of evil is at its strongest if the atheist can defend the claim that God has to at least be equally good to everybody in the exact same way. So for instance, like, you know, the fact that Ben and I are living in the West and we have a pretty high standard of living compared to someone in Haiti or, uh, you know, in a village in, in India, right? This seems to not be compatible with equibenevolence. And that would be a decisive problem with the very idea of God's goodness. But if you can say God can be good, even fully good without being equibenevolent, then you can remove that barrier as well. So, like, the reason why it doesn't violate the symmetry principle, so this is the next bullet point, God only violates the symmetry principle if no human being obtains communion with him. So the idea under natural law theory, and then specifically if you apply it to Christian theology, is that the fundamental final end for which human beings were created 
the way in which all the goods that we have get unified together and are properly ordered is when they are directed at God, who is the source of all goodness, all beauty, all truth, everything itself. So that's our final end. That's what we were made for. You know, uh, we were made for communion with God, ultimately speaking. So the idea is that you can have malfunction in the natural order, but you can only have malfunction if there is a norm in the first place. And the norm has to actually be there or obtain in order for you to have malfunction. So this is to say that technically speaking, the, princ the symmetry principle isn't violated so long as... Um, so, so long as at least one person obtains communion with God, because then there is being to that telos. That's the best way to put it. So then I would say that all theodicies obtain a plausibility boost immediately, because what the theist no longer needs to provide is like, um, you know, like, let's say a case by case, perfect answer to everything. So for instance, like, let me, let me lay down the soul making theodicy, right? And then Ben could respond, well, guess what? There are some evils that are so great that nobody gains any character development from them. They destroy somebody, depress them, throw them off completely. Then I would say, okay, look, the soul making theodicy, technically speaking, could be part of the answer. And the theist is not necessarily obligated to provide a whole comprehensive theodicy that's going to cover every single kind of maybe the instance that counts this as a counterexample, right? Because in principle, it can't disprove the existence of God. Omnibenevolence doesn't have to be equibenevolence. And also, we know of a situation in which the symmetry principle would be violated if no human being obtained the final end of communion with God. So then I would actually want to now offer my own theodicy on how to deal with the problem of evil. So I call this a two worlds theodicy. This is based on Augustine's free will defense and it's combined with the two worlds theodicy. So the idea is that basically God allows good and evil unhinged potential in this world for the sake of obtaining the maximal qualitative depth of virtue and the greatest final world beings. So what does this mean? What this means is the following. So I define the maximal qualitative depth of virtue as you have the greatest instantiations possible of good and evil attacking one another. So take, for instance, uh, Martin Luther King protesting against the racism in the South. There are horrible instances of suffering, but nonetheless, Martin Luther King comes down and has this message of love, has this message of hope. He stands up for the poor. He stands up for the minority and the oppressed. There's something intrinsically more beautiful, more qualitatively superior about that kind of goodness when it is in opposition to such great evil. Consider, for instance, also like the example of Jesus of Nazareth, if Christian theology is true. Jesus willingly bears, in some way, the sins of the world upon himself. He allows his executioners to mock him, to kill him, to strip him naked, to crucify him on a cross. And on that cross, Christ is pleading for their forgiveness, and he's asking God to show mercy to his executioners. And this is all while his disciples are watching him, his friends, the Jewish people whom he loves, the king of the Jews, right? He's the king of the Jews and king of the world. And also in the presence of his mother, who's in the crowd watching her son be crucified, and he is pleading with God to forgive the people who are killing him. There's something qualitatively deeper, more beautiful, more poignant and significant about that kind of goodness. And ultimately speaking, when God creates the final world, where everything is set right and back in its proper order, the kinds of beings like us who have endured great evil and suffering and then are perfected and sanctified and made into the perfect reflection or image of God, in that kind of world, we would be beings who had experienced great evil and nonetheless we said, we're going to choose God. We're going to choose the perfect source of love and beauty, and we will submit ourselves fully to the supreme reality of goodness. So the two worlds theodicy is basically arguing, look, because I don't have to offer you a totally comprehensive explanation, let me offer you a story or a narrative that at least makes sense of why we would see great evils, but also great goodness at the same time. And that's the idea there. So there's a lot to talk about. I want to see what Ben has to say. But yeah, that's the whole argument I've put. Um, do you want to do that or do you want to move into the quiet? Cause there's questions for me on the next slide. Yeah. Do you have, do you have questions you want to ask about this slide though? Or. Well, cause I'll be able to answer 
those questions in combination with the problem of evil. Cool. Okay. So let me go to the questions to Ben, right? So, um, so this is just going to be a broad overview, right? So question one, do you want to do like um, down each of the questions or go yeah. in? Okay. So then is it fair to say that your moral theory is non-theistic, but not atheistic? Because for instance, it doesn't seem to be in principle incompatible with the existence of a God. Just interested in that. So I think this is just a fantastic question and one which I really, really want to emphasize because the answer to the question is there is nothing atheistic about my view. My view is entirely compatible with a theistic view. In fact, it's the view I, w I take trying to change my mind to theism. So I think that theism makes important claims. Again, I'll use the claim, God is perfectly moral or God is good. These are moral claims. These are claims that I think can be true in a reason implying sense. And so it matters if there is something in the world that is always worthy of our worship. My view implies that we would have to take that seriously. If there is a being who issues commands, those commands might be arbitrary, but we still have some sort of obligation to them in the same sense that we would still have obligations to like please our benefactors. So like if God says you have to worship on Saturday instead of Sunday, yeah, that command might be arbitrary, but we would still have the reason to obey our benefactors. So I think that not only is my view compatible with theism, I would make, make the much stronger claim that my view, that my view, if theism is going to be true, some form of ethical non-naturalism has to be true. Either I make an even stronger claim that either my view is right or some form of moral nihilism is right. Either my view, either some things matter in a reason implying sense or nothing matters in a reason implying sense. If nothing matters in a reason implying sense, that view is close to nihilism. It's a very strong claim that I, I obviously, I can't defend too much here, but I think it does satisfactorily, satisfactorily answer the question here. There's nothing atheistic about my moral framework. In fact, I would encourage theists to look into it because I, I think it is the right, not only do I think it's the right meta-ethical framework, I think it's the one that helps us make best sense of the essential theistic concepts. All right. Um, so do you think unification is, uh, is desirable for an explanation of reality? Or how do you so, interpret that? Again, I think, I think this is just a great question. So if we, if we recall before I pointed out that there was some signposts that we needed to take note of, that there was, um, especially for our conversation about the problem of evil, there were um, claims that uh, were essential to Swan's view that were not essential to mine. And so I was saying, like, look, this is a theoretical virtue of simplicity that my view doesn't have to take on these additional claims. But I also said that this wasn't a decisive consideration. Well, why isn't it a decisive consideration? Well, because there's something called explanatory power. We might increase the complexity of some view in order to explain a much wider range of data. So while I made that point with those signposts, the retort on the other side of this, which Swan makes, um, I'll use the, the label explanatory power. He's saying, look, I can explain so many more different things with my view, with my additional claims than you can. And then this is a consideration which counts more um, in favor of my view than your view. So when you ask me, what do you think, do you think unification is desirable for an explanation of reality? Yes, I think that's one of, your stronger points by trying, like you, the strength of your case is not going to be made on simplicity. It's going to be made on explanatory power. I mean, it just is. That's just kind of how those chips fell. And so I think it's, it's, it's really important to mention those things here and now, especially after we just talked about the problem of evil. So I just laid out examples that seem intuitively obvious that are unjustified evils. Well, Swan then came in and gave his theodicies and how he thinks we can avoid that conclusion. Well, the considerations which go into avoiding that conclusion are going to appeal to that explanatory power of all those considerations that he laid out at the beginning. 
that's something that's very, very easily missed on both sides of this debate. And I think it's very important. Again, it's why I like this question, because I think it, it's, it's drawing our attention to explanatory power. And it helps us see if we're, if we're weighing evidence on a scale, it helps us see better one of the pieces of evidence that gets put on the Thomas side of the scale. So let me, um, let me ask a, some, you know, secondary questions. So, um, so you, you would agree that like moral realism, let's just, let's just say like we have this image, right, of all of reality. And in this set of reality, there's like moral truths, right? You wouldn't say that the moral truths necessarily have to fit into reality in the same way like that we have like causal, like we have a causal reality. We have an ontological reality about how things are composed and so forth. You would say that they don't have to be unified altogether under that same explanation, but they can still share in that same set of reality. Correct. So I would say, I would use examples, and this is perfect for a segue into your next um, question, something like mathematics. So mathematical facts are not causal facts. Um, logical facts, like the laws of logic and the rules of inference, these are not causal facts. Modal claims, things about what are possible or necessary, you know, some possible world. Those aren't claims about the causal reality. Possible worlds don't cause anything. But that doesn't mean that we can't have a unified picture of reality in which we understand the types of truths that there can be. So I think this is where Kant becomes incredibly helpful for us because we can see that the causal knowledge that we ascribe is, is through our experiences. Through, through our five senses. And so that we get knowledge from causes that way. But we also have rational intuition. And those rational intuitions aren't limited to analytical statements, statements that are true by definition. We can make substantive claims that are of pure reason, that are independent of our empirical, the, the empirical descriptions and the empirical information that we get from our five senses. And so they, it's, it's non-analytical a priori knowledge. And so that's different kind of knowledge than causal knowledge. And we're going to have knowledge of it differently than we would have causal, you know, empirical descriptions of knowledge. Mm -hmm. All and right. So, so oh. the next question is, in what sense are moral values and duties real in your view? Mm -hmm. Real in the same way that mathematical truths are real the same way that modal truths are real or logical truths are real and that they don't add anything ontologically weighty to, re to the causal realm. You don't need numbers to bump into things in order to have mathematical truths. You don't need, you know, facts about reasons and values to bump into things to have truths about those. All right. So you're ready to get your mind blown? Yeah. <laughs> so I remember last time, like your mind was blown when I said that uh, goodness and being are identical, right? Like there's no fact value distinction. So part of the Aristotelian Thomas synthesis is realism about numbers, about color, about like some abstract properties do have causal powers. So <laughs> yeah, see, I, so, and that's, that's the other side of this uh, discussion. So yeah. Where I would try to avoid those. There's other people, you know, nominalists yeah. uh, are an example. You know, they're, they're trying to take these things that we, we say are abstract truths and, you know, reduce them or ground them in something more ontologically weighty. I don't actually think that the questions mm -hmm. that nominalists and Platonists ask are even clear enough to be worth answering. I think the intuition that there's this ontologically platonic realm does sound implausible. I think it's because you're thinking about the logical space of reasons in the same way that you're thinking about the logical space of causes. And we can't think about these two, th they, can't, they will not necessarily map on one another. Mm. And so all the attempts to do so will introduce problems. So my argument is going to be to point to those problems, to say, no, no, look, this can't be done. And it's going to introduce problems. And there they are. Yeah, because I think it's a really helpful distinction when you talk about how, like, at least on your view, right, like, um, my knowledge of, let's say, the causal order about how natural things act is different than, let's say, you know, like, when I speak of numbers and abstract concepts 
And then you'd consider morality, even if, it, if it's an abstract concept in a way, it still has reason giving properties to it. And we it. still apply it to the yeah. causal domain. So yeah. you take mathematical principles and apply it to the causal world all the time. And it would be no different with our ethical theories. Mm -hmm. Just like mathematicians shouldn't worry that there are observations in the world that imply all of their mathematical theories are false or that they're all of their mathematical theories are false because there aren't these ontologically weighty platonic numbers out there. I don't think they should, I just don't think they should have to worry mm -hmm. about that. So like, a, a, I don't think ethicists should have to worry that all of their theories are false or could be overturned by uh, empirical observations in the world. I just don't, I just don't think so. Yeah. So Rob Coons, like the, re so he makes this argument that like numbers actually do have causal powers because he believes they actually place limits on what reality can be and what reality can do. So for instance, if you're like a scientific realist, so take like the Higgs boson, you know, uh, the Higgs boson particle, right? Like um, the scientist behind discovering that he was just sitting one day in his office, I think, and he was laying out the equations of nature. And then he hypothesized that there would be this, because of the mathematical structure and order in nature, that there would be this Higgs boson particle, right? And then, you know, lo and behold, later, it was confirmed that indeed there is that particle that exists in the real world. So then the argument would be like, if you're a moral realist, like at least on my view, right? If you're a moral realist, then it's going to be very easy for you to start cons consulting the causal order. And this thing that you, we might consider abstract actually has a very real infusion into nature itself. So that even like mathematical truths are infused into nature itself. So they're both like in that same reality. And even though they might be different in their content at root, they can both be explained by the same ultimate unified explanation, if that makes sense. So your next question was, is the relationship between yeah. goodness and natural facts accidental or causal? Well, actually, so wait, the next question was, what's your take on the semantical oh, causal? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. you're right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big question I wanted to ask you. <laughs> yeah, um, so I guess I did kind of already answer this one beforehand. In that yeah. I, there's the triviality objection. So that's the big thing that I have. So there's the plausibility of the semantical is you're saying there's got to be this information that transfer and whatnot. But I would say that's, I would concede all of that. So that's all well and good. But even still, if that's the semantics that you're going to choose to take, if goodness or reasons are not primitive on your view, then all of our normative and moral claims are going to state trivial facts. And so that the, um, semantic plausibility doesn't actually end up being there because the things that we're sure of, the things that become plausibility, that uh, ethical naturalism and, and functionalism would make sense of, would just be trivial, trivial facts. They wouldn't actually be moral facts. They wouldn't help us decide um, what's worth achieving or how to act rightly. They would just tell us facts about the causal world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then another thing to mention too is like, this might be a helpful like way of viewing things. Like, um, so for instance, let's go back to the example of scientific realism. So, you know, I don't know if you're a scientific realist or not, but yes. Okay. So then, <laughs> so then, you know, like the idea here is that under scientific realism, right. Or at least under how I view it, right. Like when you look into nature itself, you see that it actually obeys a mathematical structure. It, there's elegance to it. There's symmetry. You can apply, you know, just these abstract concepts and find, if you will, their instantiations in reality itself. And the idea is that because God is the creator of the natural world, at least in my view, that he created it intrinsically, inherently with that order embedded within it. And the same holds for the moral dimension as well, that like, because the reason why being and goodness are convertible and why you can draw a moral law from the teleological order is because being itself is packed with goodness, if you will. Like it's, it, the moral law is built into being itself and we just discover it. Just as in the case of um, science, it's not the case that we're inventing the law of gravity. There is this thing in the world that has this gravitational force and so forth and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the point is that we're just discovering it. And that's how ethics, on my view, is a science. And so at this point, I would move from the triviality objection back to the is-ought gap. 
Yeah, yeah. Say, and then I would just reject it. Scientific <laughs> realism applies to the logical space of causes. But when we're dealing with morality, we're in the logical space of reasons. But that's not to say that there aren't laws that govern reasons, because I think there are. They're mm -hmm. just not causal laws. So something like a utilitarian principle could be considered a law uh, of, of some kind of be, you know, a necessary law, but it wouldn't say anything about the causal world. And it would not be discoverable through the natural sciences. Mm -hmm. um, and if you tried to use the natural sciences to go in the causal world and deduce these normative conclusions from purely non-normative premises, that's what the non-naturalists will call the naturalistic fallacy. Mm. And that gets to our next question then. So is the relationship between goodness and natural facts, on your view, accidental or causal slash essential? So I wouldn't use any of those terms. I yeah. would go back to the modal language that I used before, but I, I, I don't think that's a problem here. Because um, what I would say is that the relationship between um, normative properties and um, natural facts or causal properties is a necessary connection. So what do I mean by that? So I mean that all the possible worlds that are identical to our world and all of their non-moral features would have the same moral features. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. So let's imagine a world that's similar to ours, but in which the Holocaust uh, happened exactly the way it did in our world too. When that possible world, it will also be wrong. There mm -hmm. is no possible world where the Holocaust will be identical to how it happened in our world, but in which it was morally right or morally permissible or morally indifferent. It's wrong in all possible worlds. Yeah. And so the easiest way to say this is that basic moral truths are necessary truths. So something, again, to, you, to borrow from a utilitarian view, they're going to say, look, pain is necessarily bad and pleasure is necessarily good. And so the, this is what's called the supervenience thesis. It's that the ethical necessarily supervenes on the non-ethical on the non-moral, and that those, you cannot have a change in moral facts unless you have a change in non-moral facts. It's non-moral facts which determine the moral facts. Let me give an example to help, because this is very abstract and it's kind of hard to grasp. So let's imagine that you come across a hungry beggar. You know, should you give him the money in your pocket? Well, whether or not you should give him the money in the pocket is going to be determined by the non-moral facts of the situation. The fact that he is a beggar and that he is hungry. If he's not a beggar, then you shouldn't give him the money out of your pocket. If he's not hungry, you should give him the money out of his pocket. If he's neither, you definitely shouldn't give him the money out of your pocket. That's how the non-moral facts necessarily determine. There's still the necessary truth that we should give our money to hungry beggars. Just take that as an example. But that's, it's, it's, the, it's the property of being hungry and the property of being a beggar, which if someone instantiates that, that's what makes it the case that we ought to give them the money in our pocket. Mm -hmm. so, so the connection mm -hmm. is necessary. So to, to, to convert it into the Thomistic type language, it would be essential. Um, it's, it wouldn't be quote unquote accidental. It wouldn't be like, you know, the Holocaust happened and it could have been more right or it could have been wrong. Mm -hmm. That's not a, that's not a uh, possibility on my view. Yeah. I'm sorry. Are you saying that it's a possibility on my view or? No, no, no. Okay. I was trying to use your, <laughs> I was trying to use your uh, terms to. Yeah. Cause I mean, I would ground just like the, ne the necessity in just truths about being itself. Right. Sure. So then, yeah, we could do that. Okay. So then I noticed that you did it. You did a you did you made a good move. So you broke the connection I was trying to make between scientific realism and moral realism, and you tried to say I think if I recall properly, like um, you could technically be a scientific realist without being a moral realist. I I forgot exactly how you explained that. Um, what was it? Uh, could you go over that one last time? Like how did you break the analogy between scientific realism and moral realism? So, or the derivation with moral realism, you are 
or moral truths. Let's just talk about moral truths. Moral truths, when we're characterizing a moral truth, we're characterizing it in the logical space of reasons. When we're characterizing a scientific truth, like mm. something discoverable by the nat natural sciences, we're describing it in the logical space of causes. Yeah. Okay. And so if the logical space of causes are going to depend necessarily on our, on our five senses, our five senses causally interacting with the world. And so that's how we come to knowledge of the, the causal world. And um, that's what all of our natural, uh, our, all of our science experiments presuppose that we're in this causal domain. But moral truths aren't empirical truths. They're not truths that we, stu that we discover about the empirical world. We don't go out in the world to discover these things. We use our a priori knowledge, our knowledge of rational intuition. Now, in the time of Hume, um, Hume believed that all a priori knowledge was analytical, meaning it was true by defini definition. And that if you tried to derive moral truths from entirely non-moral premises, you'll commit the naturalistic fallacy. And he got the is ought gap from that. And he went on to put forward a sentimentalist theory of ethics. Well, Kant comes around and says, no, there are metaphysical truths that are non-analytical that we can't know merely through experience. We have to rationally intuit them. And so I believe that moral truths are some of these, that when we're in the logical uh, space of reasons, when we're trying to find the domain of ethical facts, we are doing pure philosophy. We aren't doing an empirical science where we go out in the world and test things we are going to have to appeal to thought experiments and we're going to have to appeal to rational intuitions. And there's going to have to be some, some level of reflective equilibrium that goes on. And so you can be a scientific realist by saying, look, I believe that the principles um, of scientific investigation and the laws in which govern the world are real things are things in the world that we discover, but that morality is in some way constructed. There is no this logical space of reasons. That's not a play, that's not a, it's not an actual space mm -hmm. that we can have true claims in. And this is what the, you know, ethical naturalists do. The people, you know, a Thomist is going to do this and they're saying, no, we can reduce all of this to the logical space of causes. Yeah, so like maybe just to stress one last point on this, and then we can move on to the last question. Um, yeah, I mean, so one of you, you know you often talk about that, that like things have this reason giving property, and um, you know, so for instance, let's say, um, but you okay, so you're not saying that the reason giving property is found in nature in the external world itself. It's sort of like in when you contemplate, right? Like, um, how do I put it? It'll be universal. Yeah. So, um, another uh, analogy to help see this mm -hmm. is we can have something can have the property of being a valid argument. So we can have a, an argument on a piece of paper with, you know, premises numbered and a conclusion. And we can say this argument has the property of being valid. Mm -hmm. But that property isn't an ontologically weighty property uh, of it. Um, the, another example is the fossil record is evidence for biological evolution, but the property of being evidence for biological evolution isn't something I have to go dig around in the fossil record. Mm -hmm. Fine. And so it's similar with morality. Goodness isn't something that you go out and discover empirically in causal ways. You have to think about principles that would be universally true for everyone and then, then apply those principles to the world. Mm -hmm. Now, and we do this all the time with mathematics. So we can, we can have a mathematical theory and apply it to the world. And it might not, it might be the wrong theory. We might say that something has a property that it didn't really have, didn't really have. We can make those mistakes. Same is true in ethics. We can say, look, um, again, we'll pick on utilitarians more. 
utilitarians say, you know, the property of pain has this reason given property, this property of everyone has a reason to want to avoid it. Maybe pain mm -hmm. doesn't have that property. Maybe pain just isn't morally relevant at all. And we are completely wrong about ethics because we cannot have any moral knowledge. That's, a, that's an epistemic possibility. That's an epistemic possibility in any domain of inquiry that we, we're not guaranteed to find truth when we go searching for it. Yeah, so then my response would be that when you mention like this reason giving property that things have, that goes back to the cognitive normativity point. So like whenever you contemplate or think about anything, you have to presuppose that you have like rationally, you have reliable faculties and that when you make these associations with, let's say, I'm going to say that this thing, even though it's not actually out there in the world, but it's about, let's say, um, pain, right? Like it's, para it's dependent upon being in the first place. Right. And it's not the case that the idea came out of nowhere in your head, but maybe there was like informational content in the outside world and there was a causal connection between that thing and its properties and then how it was processed in your brain that caused you to come to that conclusion in a way. So then I would say that, you know, we can talk about reason giving properties, but that sounds incredibly close to like the concepts that I talked about with cognitive normativity. So you need to offer your, you know, your take on mind, you need to also infer that there's a reliable causal order in the first place. So then I would just say teleology is your best guarantee. So then I would say that, yeah, you can kind of stave off some ontology, but it's inevitably there in the background lurking. All right, last question. <laughs> All right, last question. So, uh, yeah, well, yeah, so like, um, we both accept that, how do I put it? We, I, we both accept that God has obligations. We don't think that God is just kind of like above it all and can do whatever he wants. So I have a feeling though, this is a hunch that I have. So this is the hunch. Um, so imagine this, the following scenario. Uh, so let's say there, there's a woman who's getting robbed by some crook and there's a police officer there, right? And this police officer decides not to intervene. And then you, you know, we're all left wondering, well, why didn't you do that thing? And he's like, ah, I just didn't feel like it, right? Well, we'd say that's a pretty bad police officer. Now, let's add some properties to him. Let's make him omniscient. Let's make him omnipotent. Let's make him, you know, all these things. And let's say that he claims that he's fully good and he still doesn't do the thing in question. Then we could still say that's a terrible police officer, you know? It's almost, when I think about the problem of evil, and when I think about like how skeptics view God, the God that they imagine they're destroying in the problem of evil, that's what I'm imagining, this kind of glorified police officer, if you will. And I'm wondering if you, one, accept that analogy is valid. And then second, I mean, do you think that somehow there's like a connection still between like, let's say my very idea of God and him somehow failing in the problem of evil, if that makes sense? So one, how do you view God, the God that you're objecting to in the problem of evil? And is that the same God that would um, be defeated on my view? So that's a bit of a messy way to ask last it. Question, I don't know about your last because so I think it it works when the, the, the problem of evil is, is sound if we are conceiving of God as an omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly moral being. Um, I have a hard time making sense of the moral claims in the Thomistic view. Um, that might be a shortcoming of, of, of you know, my understanding. Um, because like I said earlier, like I, it's a lot of times, especially when you deny the moral agency of God, it's hard to distinguish it from a pantheistic God. Mm. At that point. I have a difficult time. And so the problem of evil clearly doesn't apply to pantheism. Doesn't under, so if, if, my understanding doesn't help me get the Thomistic God concept past pantheism, then the problem of evil doesn't work. Um, where the problem of evil does work is when I conceive of God, like I said, uh, really the, 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 the one is the moral perfection. And to um, what I was saying is that God would care, would one, care about the consequences that occur in the world he would always fulfill any moral obligations that he had, and he would have an unsurpassable set of character virtues. 
So things like, you know, being loving um, or being understanding or, um, you know, being faithful, being truthful, being just, so forth, so forth. So, you know, the um, cor courageous uh, temperament, if you want to, you know, get into the uh, classic Greek values, mm -hmm. he would have this unsurpassable set of character virtues. Well, whatever they are. And so those are the claims that I think drive the reasoning of an argument from evil, because you're asking yourself, what would the world look like if it were created by a being with these properties? Mm. And one of the ways to avoid the conclusion of the problem of evil is to remove those properties from God. So if you say that God is not perfectly good, well, then you can avoid the problem of evil. And so one of my worries about the Thomistic word is that they've watered down the concept of God so much that now when we say that God is morally perfect, that's say something trivial or tra uh, stating something in such a way. It, it might uh, avoid the problem of evil, but it comes at a very, very great cost. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So it seems like in some sense, like your, your idea of like on the goodness of God would be something like an achievement, if you will, like he has to do certain things, right? He has, he certainly has to act in certain ways, but yeah. I don't want to confuse mm -hmm. obligation with value here, nor do I want to presuppose give priority to one or the other um, because I'm not all theists will concede such, mm. such assumptions because so i'm not trying to beg any questions here when i when i do that which is why i take uh, i have a very uh methodical way of laying out the concept of god mm. because um this is a concept that i want to be true one so i'm trying to um prevent myself from falling into kind of a wishful thinking but also it by having this concept, it helps me answer that question. What would a God created world actually look like? I think it's, you're taking the problem of evil as seriously as you possibly can at that point. And you're mm -hmm. letting the, you're, you're following the argument instead of building the argument around your view, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, so one is that when you talk about like God fulfilling his obligations, so I just go back to the symmetry principle and I'd say, yep, God has fulfilled all of his obligations, right? But you'd say he only has one obligation. So I would say that he yeah. has more obligations than mm -hmm. that. So for example, that if, if we're taking any moral point of view, we're taking an impartial point of view. And so that if um, from an impartial point of view, Every no one's well being counts for more than anyone else's. We all have the same world. Mm. And I think there yeah. are implications of that. I think that is a self evident truth of morality, and that obligations will follow from that principle that are substantively different than just the symmetry principle. I think the symmetry principle is far, far too narrow mm -hmm. to be anything like a useful moral principle that would help any sort of agent decide between acts in yeah. the sense of this act being better than this act or this right this act being more right than this act mm. um so what's an example of an obligation that god would god would have an obligation to love us he would have an obligation to love each of us unconditionally um because he because being perfectly good, God would be perfectly loving. So notice that I'm I'm making very, very specific claims here. I'm making claims about love. The symmetry principle doesn't make specific claims about love. And so that's where I would say that 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 principle is just too narrow. You avoid the problem of evil by limiting what morality can be, by reducing morality to this one simple principle for God that doesn't help him decide between, or at least it's not clear how it mm -hmm. helps him decide between acts. Yeah. And then like the other thing is too, like, um, let's see here. So, I mean, I was just going to make a point about virtues too. So like, you know, if you define a virtue as 
you know, that which dispositions you towards the good, and then God is by nature perfect, then, you know, he would already have the virtues by being, right? Mm -hmm. But of course, that's not going to help because, you know, you'd be like, well, if he has the virtues, then he's going to do this or, you know, so forth. Yeah. So then two points here. One is that, you, so you've accepted the second hard point, which is that omnibenevolence implies equibenevolence, right? Which is that he, like, so you kind of had this egalitarian view where God would love everybody unconditionally or in the same so, way. Yeah, but it's impartiality. Yeah. So it's impartiality because we're not, we're taking uh, a view from nowhere, so to speak. We're taking mm. this impartial point of view where we see ourselves as one agent in a world of other agents. So I'm not saying that God would treat everyone equally, mm -hmm. but I am saying that God would care equally about each one of them because God is unconditionally loving. Yeah. God, God, is, God would love each of them unconditionally by his very nature. And he would have created these beings for that reason. He created the world because it was relevantly good or worth creating because it had finite creatures in it that he could have a relationship with. Mm -hmm. So, and you would say that that entails that he has to have a relationship with all yes, of them. It would be good. Mm -hmm. or he would love it. No, not that he has to have a relationship with it. He might sit back and let finite creatures choose whether they want to have a relationship with him or not. Okay. He's not going to force it, but he's not going to be closed to a relationship. He will have the obligation of always being open. So is this like, is this almost like divine hiddenness coming in in a way or? Yes, this is, so I'm using yeah. that as an example just because, yeah. uh, but that's just one example of an obligation that he could have. Um, he would, another obligation would, would be to listen to all of our prayers. He would have an obligation to listen to us. So that would be another type of moral obligation. Um, so. You could then say also by pointing to moral patience, like non-human animals, what would God's obligations to these sorts of beings be? And there, I think the, your uh, egalitarian thought um, has more uh, oomph to it, just because we're talking about moral patience and not moral agents. We're not talking about some, something that can use its free will to rebel in some way. We're talking about a morally innocent creature that will not come into any sort of saving, salvation, grace type relationship with God, but will just suffer, just for the sake of suffering. And so it seems to me that a perfectly loving, a perfectly good being would have some sort of obligations mm. to these sorts of beings such, such that they don't suffer in these sorts of ways. Yeah, I mean, so let's see here. Yeah, so I, um, so one is that I think the big difference too is that we have like this idea, like I have this idea of a chain of being where there's an actual ontological hi hierarchy between beings. And then I would say that, you know, when you talk about unjustified evils, so, you know, Brian Davies distinguishes between evil suffered and evils done. And he says something like, it is permissible for God to like allow there to be evil suffered, right? But God himself does not ever commit evils himself so for instance like um when you talk about unjustified evils right i would say unjustified for whom right well then if you look at if you base morality on ontology and you know the genuses in which they fall under then i would say like oh yeah that's right like it's unjustified for human beings to go out and kill each other or rape each other right that's horrendous but then if you like it's and even you could say that we have an obligation to stop those things from happening, especially if we knew that they could happen and we had the power that you just stop them. We have the courage and so forth. But then I would say that on God, like I would break the chain there and say that things change when you get to God. And then I'd have to offer like a principled account. And I try to do that with the symmetry principle. And I try to do that also with the two worlds theodicy in the process. I would push back for the worry of when you say, when you ask the question for whom? Yeah. It's immoral for whom? Mm -hmm. You're presupposing some sort of relativism. That would be my worry. Not exactly. Yeah. Because I would say mm -hmm. when you, the answer to the question for whom? For everyone. Morality is for everyone. It's universal. It's objective and does not, does not depend on any agent. So the question, um, is it immoral for whom? is an irrelevant when, when we ask it it's not a relevant question mm. it doesn't the answer to that question 
will not be any different than if you didn't put that on. The yeah. only way it would be different is if relativism was true, some sort of subjectivism where mm. what was morally true depended on the subject. Yeah, and then I would just say that if there, like, so if there is an actual hierarchy of being and a hierarchy of goodness, then it would technically be permissible for God to command certain things, right? That human beings on their own perhaps wouldn't have the authority to command. Because, right, and then if you go back to like the metaphysics of authority and so forth and rational desirability, um, you know, I, I would make the case that, let's see here. So I wouldn't make the case that like the obligations that God has, and let's say the obligations that humans have, they're not totally like separate from each other. So for instance, like, um, let's see here, um, because both God and human beings exist and like they are, partic they are um, acting in certain ways, if you will, manifesting themselves. And there's going to be obviously like principles. So something like the symmetry principle could be Alan Gaworth's um, principle of generic consistency, which is just the idea that agents act consistently on the commitments and promises that they make. Right, like that would that would apply all the way down, but the precise content and when in those circumstances it applies to whom, that's when I'd say I would draw the difference. So, for instance, like let's say that, um, so going back to the supremacy of God thesis. So let's take like um, uh, let's take an example. Um, suppose that, uh, let's see here. Oh man, I'm running out of steam. <laughs> it's been a while. How okay. long have we like two hours or something? Something like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, so let me see if I can actually make a coherent thought out of this. Uh, well, so, but uh, yeah, to, to help you out because I th I think the the play of the dialectical here is that I'm going to insist it actually being on the euthyphro dilemma might uh, is that morality is a function of reason and not authority. Yeah. Whereas you're yeah. trying to double down mm -hmm. and you're saying no 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 no, it's a function of the authority. And not the reason, but that the reasons are still important. But what what really at the base of this is important, the fundamental thing, is the authority. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't want to say no, no, no. no. The, the fundamental important thing is mm. the reason. And so we we'll, we can call that an impasse at this point. But that's yeah. where but but that's where the that that's where the di the, the discussion leads us. That's yeah. The between the two of us. So let me put it like this. So now, thank you. That, that was very helpful. So yes, yeah, the, the fundamental thing for you is like reason, right? And these, these laws of reason just apply everywhere, no matter what to whom. Don't have to ask the question of, oh, does it apply to him or that or whatever. For me, I would say that morality is fundamentally based on being. And that if you can have different hierarchies of being, like if there is a hierarchy of being and God is at the top, and let's say, you know, you have humans and then you have like lower animals, like the more obligations and the way in which they're manifested are going to change as you go through the different ladders of being. And then in the case of God, I would say like, because God is subsistent being itself is essentially goodness itself and is the thing that all things desire intrinsically. He has superiority, or if you say like a kind of an executive privilege, if you will, over all things. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I'm not objecting to that. That was great. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so then, so then, um, yeah. So then the idea is that, you know, for instance, if I fail to do something, let's say that I have the power, I have the obligation, whatever, to stop that woman from being robbed. You know, let's say I'm armed, right? And I have all the courage in the, my body to stop the act from happening and I don't, that would count against me. But then God, who is, let's say, in heaven, managing all of creation, keeping all things in existence, that wouldn't count against him. Gotcha. All well, right. The last question was. Well, that was actually the last question in a really long. Uh, oh, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, why do you think God's goodness should be identical to human goodness? And you would base that on reason. Yes. Okay. Because I would, I would then. Yeah. Uh, to use the example from earlier. So about uh, the property of being valid. So we could say, well, why do you think that inductive validity should be identical to inductive validity? And what I would say is they're not identical because there are two different ways of coming to knowledge. Just like a God is a different kind of being 
than a finite person would be. So they're not identical in that sense, but they are the, a valid argument is universal between the two. It does not discriminate. A valid argument for a deductive argument is a, and a valid argument from an inductive argument are still both valid. They still both use the fundamental concept of a valid argument. And mm -hmm. I would say goodness is exactly like this in that, yes, the good of God and the good of humans will be different, but in the sense of goodness, there is no relevant difference because they both make use of the same irreducibly normative concept of being good. All right. Um, <laughs> let me ask you one last question. Fair this enough. might, this might be unpleasant, but let's go. Um, so, so like the re so I'm trying to hit on this point that at least, um, there is a hierarchy or chain of being, if you will, and that has some relevance to ethics. So, I mean, take for instance, so it's not just going to be based on reason alone. There's going to be some consideration of the kinds of beings that you're going to act, be acting towards. So, sure. oh man. Okay. I don't know if I like this example, but here goes. So suppose that like you're, you're starving, right? And, you know, like maybe it's like uh, the COVID-19 crisis has gone totally haywire and, you know, we're in a walking dead scenario almost. And, you know, you're in your house and you have, let's say, um, you and whoever else is with you. And then you have your cats and let's say you're starving, right? Like, do you think it'd be morally permissible for you to eat your cats? Yes. In that situation, yes. Right. And then like, uh, but, but you love them, right? But do you have an obligation to love them or... Yeah, I do have an obligation to it, but uh, there's also, um, this is where values are going to come in conflict. So I also value my life. Yeah. Um, I'm also a moral agent, whereas my cats are mere moral patients. So yeah. um, I think it's justifiable to say that I have a intrinsic right to life, but my cat does not have an intrinsic right to life. That's why mm -hmm. it's... Um, not immoral for me to go euthanize my cat, but it would be immoral for me to go euthanize my wife. Yeah. Um, it, it, I, I, <laughs> I um, Oof. Hope you didn't hear that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm trying to get is that there is this hierarchy too, on my view, in that there's going to be different capacities for reason. Mm -hmm. So um, moral patients aren't going to have obligations not because there aren't obligations, but because they aren't the kinds of beings that can um, understand and appreciate reasons and control their behavior through reason. So it's just the, the concept of a moral agent just gets no purchase. Mm. In my view. Um, does that mean that it would be easy to eat my cat? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely not. It would be probably one of the hardest decisions I, I would ever make. And it could be even more difficult in that, you know, we can use real world scenarios where, you know, people have crashed in airplanes in the Andes mountains and they've been forced to eat one another. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we might say that's, you know, that's horrible and we can't, you know, it would be immoral in any other situation for us to eat other people. But in that situation is we can understand the justification. We can see how two very, very deep values um, the respect for other persons and the desire to live, this is where impartial benevolence and rational self-interests are inevitably going to come into conflict. They're just, what is, what will make things go impartially best just isn't always going to be what's in my self-interest. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes morality hard. That's why moral behavior, it's just easier to be selfish than it is to be impartial. <laughs> yeah. So, let me see here. Um, yeah, because th th there was a point to asking that question. And the point was, so like you recognize, so you, so obviously what you're going to say is um, because you base morality on reason, right? And because God is a rational agent and you and I are rational agents, there's not going to be this significant hierarchy, hierarchical We're divide. We're both going to be moral agents. Yeah. We're both going to be able to have the necessary cognitive capacity to act for reasons mm -hmm. to act in ways that are better than others and understand that we're acting in ways that are better than others. Yeah. And we, I mean, we can say that, yeah, God knows all this instantaneously and that he's omniscient. That's, that's all well and good. But if we're saying that he's acting and that he's acting for reasons, 
which mm-hmm. I think that's what we need. That's what we need to be saying. If we're, if we're taking this God concept seriously and we're taking something like omniscience seriously, we're talking about a being that would know what all the reason giving facts are and would know how to make things go impartially best. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because, okay, so the reason why I brought up that question was because I was trying to say that, look, there's still some relevant ontology going on here, right? Like, I'm trying to, you know, like uh, Thanos, what was it during uh, Endgame when he's like, I am inevitable, right? No, I'm trying no, to... Yeah, yeah, no spoilers. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> I'm trying to, like, I'm trying to do the same thing with Aristotelian Thomism and ontology. Actually, no, that movie's been out for a year. I yeah, mean, if, probably... if you don't know, <laughs> we're not violating any moral obligations. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the point that I'm trying to make is that, like, even when you talk about, like, rational capacities, right? I remember John Finnis and John Rawls had a debate with one another on the subject. And, like, Rawls wanted to believe that even people who were cognitively disabled had intrinsic moral value, but they didn't actually have the rational capacities that other average human beings had, right? And then John Finnis was like, oh, easy solution, on my view, because he's a natural law theorist of sorts. He was saying, like, if there's a rational animal substance, like that, what that thing fundamentally is, then those obligations that you have to a quote unquote regular normal person would apply to that disabled person as well. And hence you would have an egalitarianism between the two of you because you're the same being qua human. So I was just going to say like, man, you got, you got to bring back ontology, man. You know, you you can't avoid it. (laughs) I'm with you. I'm with you. It's definitely certain, certainly an important part of philosophy and moral philosophy. All right. Well, Ben, do you want to say anything before I close the episode? Uh, thank you for having me on again. These conversations are always just super fun and it's yeah. super helpful for my work. And I hope it's been super helpful with you. I've loved going through your PowerPoint and I hope my uh, discussion brief uh, methodology has helped you with some insights and, you know, clear expression of your own thoughts. Yeah. Well, let me also say thank you to Ben, because every time we talk, you know, I always leave just feeling like I learned something new, really deeply appreciating how Ben approaches things. And, you know, like Ben's page, Relay Theology and all the people that he works with, they really do present the best that the other side has to say. And I really do appreciate that. And I hope this dialogue in some way shows people like, oh, yeah, there are intelligent things that atheists and religious people have to say to one another. And I guess that's the interesting things on both sides. And that's the beauty of it. So thank you, Ben, for participating in this beauty with me. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.